You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. Whether it's for food, fuel, drinks, or snacks, about half of the U.S. population shops at a convenience store every day. We'll talk about what we see at stores and what the future may hold for our industry. It's really not what somebody purchases that's the most important thing when you shop at a store, whether it's a convenience store or something else. It's those micro experiences that really define the experience, that interaction with a clerk, the how do you perceive a bathroom or any other event within the store. So the key is, how do you take all those micro events, put them all together and have a great experience so that people want to come back to your store? That's the topic of today's podcast. Welcome to Convenience Matters. My name is Jeff Leonard with Nax. Hey Jeff, it's Carolyn Schneer also with Nax. And today, Carolyn and I are joined by Michel Falcon. He is a hospitality entrepreneur, advisor, author, keynote speaker. He's joining us by phone and he spoke at the Nax Leadership Forum. We're gonna talk about some of the tools that he told us about uh, related to what retailers can do to be more part of the hospitality business. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Jeff and Carolyn. I'm really looking forward to it. So micro experiences, that's something that uh, you talk a lot about in in your presentations. Can you take us through what micro experiences are, those mini experiences that make up the very important loyalty and transaction? Absolutely. Uh, by definition, a, a micro customer experience uh, for me and in, in my business and uh, how I define it for audiences, just like I did at Nax, is a, a small, memorable and affordable gesture that you do for your customer that resonates with them for years. I would argue that this system and process uh, may outperform a a traditional marketing campaign because uh, these experiences are ones that your customers have never seen before, not just in your industry, but perhaps in competing industries. Uh, Now, it goes against the conventional uh, rule of thumb or wisdom of you must deliver wow experiences. Now, there is a place in our businesses for wow experiences, but you know, a wow experience can be defined differently from customer to customer. Often wow experiences mean free things, gifts and so forth. And and that isn't entirely sustainable or affordable for, for some businesses. When I developed the micro customer experience theory and brought it into our hospitality business, it was to leverage customer intelligence. We refer to it as CI by learning something about the customer and leveraging that intelligence to create a micro customer experience. And the output of that is an experience they've never seen before. So for example, let's say I was one of your customers and by way of conversation, if you speak to me long enough, you're going to learn two things uh, amongst others perhaps, but the two things I will weave into the conversation are you will learn that I'm a diehard Vancouver Canucks hockey fan and you will learn that I have a Rottweiler dog named Maggie. So how do we train our team members to pick up on that customer intelligence and deliver a micro customer experience that earns my loyalty? So I'm, I'm spitballing here but as, as an idea, but what if... I was a regular customer of yours and you knew that I came in every Thursday perhaps. And one day I show up and there is an affordable chew toy for Maggie. Maybe her name is on it or maybe it's something that doesn't cost any money at all. Like how about that Vancouver Canucks win last night, even though you might not even be a fan. So these are the micro customer experiences, those subtle, affordable and memorable gestures that we need to train our team members on. And let's be very clear. If we want our team members to do these things, we too as leaders have to get involved and we have to advocate these programs and create alignment behind them. And it has to go a little bit more than the basics. I I go to a chiropractor irregularly and he's a really nice guy. Um, 
But the two questions he always asked me is, he's, uh, how's the family, how's work? And I, it took me a while to figure out, you know, he kind of cares on the ans- about the answer, but he probably asks everybody the exact same question. And I just go into like this spiel, like he actually cares about my work and stuff like that. Um, but it's a little deeper than that. He has to, what would be the next level is what you're saying is if he goes, how's your job at NAX? Mm. Then it's a little bit deeper. That's what you're saying. And how do you, how do you get people to want to know that information and care about that information and deliver a response that shows they care about that information? It starts with the interview process. Uh, within our uh, organization, and I had referenced this uh, during my keynote at the next conference, is you have to hire individuals that know how to care about a stranger, genuinely. Because that's ultimately what we're asking our team members to do is care about a stranger. Your customers at one point will be a stranger to every single one of your employees. Hopefully you grow to become you know, friends and have a deeper bond than that. But I can't convince somebody who doesn't have it in their DNA, and we call it customer-centric DNA, to do it every single day habitually with enthusiasm. There's some individuals that are just cut from a certain cloth. You know, often, you know, perhaps you work with some individuals today uh, at, at Max. You know, every time they enter the room, they're very uplifting. They generally care and listen rather than just going through the motions. So you have to pinpoint that in the interview process. Uh, what is their body language like? You know, how did they respond to the first email when you said that you wanted to set up an interview? Did they show up on time? Were they enthusiastic? When they left the interview, did you see them hold the door open for some in, for an individual as they were leaving? These are the things that I'm trying to discover because it becomes infinitely easier as a leader to build a customer-focused team if you ensure that the interview process is ironclad and there's guardrails in place to ensure that you do not hire individuals that you're going to have to train over and over and over again. And maybe their behavior will spike. There's going to be ebbs and flows. What if you just had individuals that just love doing these things? How would your business transform? How would your results improve? You know what I mean? We've done it. I've done enough um, uh, personal, like, those assessments where you have to figure out like what your you know whether it's um, Myers Briggs or one of those assessments that's like yeah. well you're generally an introvert and you know if you are you have to work a little harder at making living life with exclamation points everywhere but you know some people just it comes naturally and some people might be completely exhausted at the end of the day but I think as you're saying it's someone who can put themselves in that position or can make themselves be in that position but then also kind of like it too so um, I think that those some of those even personality tests do you think those could even apply here? Yeah, we use something called the predictive index, but whether it's predictive index or Myers Briggs, yes, there can be an element to it. There's the you know the science um, behind that. Um, often, I've heard individuals say you should only hire a play uh, a type individuals or a a players, right? Everyone that always excels. Don't hire anybody that isn't an A player. Well. I also want to be six foot six and, and play for the Los Angeles Lakers, but that's not that's not going to happen. So just because you have an individual on your current team who might be a little bit more introverted, does that mean you shouldn't hire them? No. Everybody has their role within the organization. You're going to have those flag bearers who just know how to do it habitually. It's a natural reflex for them. But there's going to be other individuals that – Maybe it exhausts, they need to exhaust a little bit more energy to, to be bubbly like that or, or to have exclamation points, as you mentioned, at, every, uh, at the end of every sentence. But what I like to do is peer cross-training. So I will set up learning and development sessions where the ambassadors, those cheerleader-type individuals, will coach the more introverted individuals on some tips and tricks on how to do that, and then vice versa. Now, the introverted individuals probably have a skill set that the ambassadors want. So how can we leverage peer cross-training? And for me, the leader of one of the leaders of the organization, 
it's not always up to me to do the learning and development. I want to leverage the individuals that are really impacting the business, the ones that are speaking to customers every single day, so that they can find their role within the organization. That's smart. I mean, I think, um, sort of side note, there's a colleague of mine here at Nax, Alicia, who she and I, if we write back and forth in an email to each other, it's like all exclamation points, every single one of them. And she sent me yeah, an it's email. It's emojis and exclamation points. That's true. But, you know, sometimes those are over the top, so we just stick to three exclamation points. And she sent me in a, uh, a meme that said, sometimes I put periods at the end of the thing so people will take me seriously. <laughs> so we, <laughs> But anyway, that's an aside. Um, I think that's one good. of the things that you made me think of is uh, today's um, – e-commerce, like when you're Amazon or, or anybody, basically, you look at something online now, all of a sudden the remarketing targets it on the side and says like, oh, you're going to like this. And like, how did you know? And now I'm onto them and I just know they're watching my browsing history and everything I do. But they're like, of course I want this squeezy dog toy for my dog whose name is Chase, but just like Baggy. And you're like, yes, I'm going to buy that impulse buy today. But when you're talking about people, customer uh, service folks and those that are in front of people in retail, it's like, um, it's AI, but it's not. It's it's really just listening. It's really teaching and training how to listen and then how to pay attention to what that is and then remember enough so that when the next person comes in. Do you um, do you often give tricks to folks so that they remember stuff like that? Is it like take notes, you know, this guy's coming in on Thursday? Or you just really hope that people just – it's ingrained into their behavior that they just know this. They know that you're yeah. coming in with Maggie. Cool. Great question. So we have two core values that w- uh, I'm going to share with you, two core values within our organization that will uh, emphasize how we do this. One of them is ownership. Right? You have to take ownership over gathering that customer intelligence, not letting it fall on deaf ears. Because there's many times where somebody's asked me, um, some, an individual from a company that I've done business with, how's your day going? And Maybe I said something like, I'm very excited. I'm just about to go to Mexico tomorrow. And they, and they respond with, oh, that's great. Have a good time. Like, oh, you could have used that, right? Um, but ownership, taking ownership over that customer intelligence. But then foresight, having the foresight to take that information and share it with your peers and your colleagues so that if I come in and – I'm speaking to another individual, there's an opportunity to continue the conversation, even if it wasn't that first person that I spoke to. Now, there's always, you want to make sure that you color within the li- uh, inside the lines. You don't want to scare your customers um, by having them think they're, how do they know that? <laughs> and true. are they always listening to me? So within reason, of course. Um, but yes, I spend a, a, a considerable amount of time uh, coaching organizations and coaching my own team of being like, that is a wealth of knowledge. If we want to create great customer experiences, our customers are giving us the opportunity on a daily basis. Let's ensure that we're not letting that customer intelligence fall in deaf ears. And let's ensure that we take that information and share it with our peers and colleagues. So that, that leads me to something I hadn't thought of previously, and maybe you have it institutionalized is when you're doing shift work, like at a convenience store, places like that. When shifts change, they share information about maintenance. This needs to be done. Share information about maybe our, how's the till looking? You know, does anything need to be done in terms of any of the food? Anything like that. But it's all operations. Are you suggesting or do your clients look at building in time, maybe five minutes to share a, a, a awesome customer experience? Like I had the person come in today and this happened and just want you to remember that it made a difference in their day today. Um, is that possible when you look at shift work and how would you build that in given that time is money? Yeah, so there's um, two ways that I perhaps approach this. Uh, in our organization, we have a daily huddle before we uh, open our venues and our restaurants. That allows us to share good news and pertinent information. Uh, but I recognize that that might not be suited for every single business. So in lieu of that, uh, we also leverage a document called the In the Know document. It's a weekly one-page document that, you know, it's self-explanatory. It's in the title. Everything that we need our team members to know is in this one document that's easy to read, bullet points, not long-winded paragraphs. 
pictures. So I created this document because I recognize that in hospitality and perhaps in many other industries as well too, things can change quite quickly. You know, in my world, menu items might change quickly at a moment's notice because we uh, got another supplier or whatever the case might be. So I said, how can we combat this? Because I don't want team members to be able to truthfully say, I didn't know. Right? So we created this document called In the Know, and it's just bullet points. Like Samantha d- did a fantastic job with this customer. Check out this Google review that we got because of it. Or don't forget it's our customer George's birthday on the 24th of January uh, and so forth. Uh, and then it comes to product changes as well too. You know, we have a new menu item. We have a new cocktail coming out. Here's everything you need to know. So it's these assets and these aids that we can create within our business that require very little heavy lifting. In our world, we'll have a SPA, a single point of accountability for every system and process. So if the in the no document doesn't go out tomorrow or the huddle doesn't happen habitually, I know who to go to. Right? That You have to take ownership. Again, going back to our core values, that's something that you said you wanted to do. You must take ownership over this. And this is where we can put some of the emphasis and lean on our and our leaders to say, you know, we're trying to make this a better workplace for you and your colleagues so that we can deliver a better experience to our customers and we can run a successful company. And, and if we grow, we grow together and perhaps there's room for advancement and career opportunities. Right? It, it all works together. Right? We cannot have uh, a great desire to deliver a great customer experience if we don't first look internal to the business and ask ourselves and, and say to ourselves, part of me, people don't fail, processes do. Mm. That's something that I was told early in my career, and I, I, I kid you not, it's something I say daily, either to myself or to my management team. People don't fail, processes do. So if you have team members on your team who aren't, quote unquote, getting it, well, maybe the process isn't there for them. Maybe that asset is missing. So I like to do a lot of critical thinking when it comes to people not getting it. You know, I like to believe that individuals are intelligent, right? And and sometimes they're the product of their environment. Uh, What type of environment have we created for them? And uh, the second part to that would be inspect what you expect. Um, If you expect a great customer experience, well, you have to look under the hood. Habitually, you can't just let it go for a month or two months and then be upset that something's not being done the way that you suspected it was going to be done, that's on the leader. That is on the leader because they didn't expect what they expected. And I think that expectation is is key there. I think um, in general, today's society, you're rushing around, you're, you're you know running into something, you want to go in quick in convenience stores especially, but you know I know um, your background's in uh, call centers and customer service. It's like I hate to say it, but you kind of, I kind of expect, and I'm a pretty optimistic person, but I expect customer service to like suck generally. And then I'm pleasantly surprised when it doesn't, right? So you, you go into the DMV, for instance, Jeff, you've been there recently. And yes. It, no I'm offense, not, but I'm you don't kidding. expect much. It, it was a terrible experience today. Uh, but anyway, there mm-hmm. was one person that left the counter and his exact words was, that wasn't as horrible as I thought it would be. That's a, that's a that plus was, day that was just, for the DMV. That, yes. <laughs> But it was just I exactly can tell what you're you, saying. If, if it was a free market, I would start my own DMV. Oh, like, yeah. I'm so fascinated by industries that are just, you know, I'm shaking my head. Like, you know, the taxi industry was one that was very vulnerable, and Uber comes in. Blockbuster, mm. not necessarily a bad experience, but if you think how much time we exhausted going to Blockbuster, like, if you really <laughs> think about it, I want to watch a movie. I'm going to drive to the store. I'm going to spend 30 minutes in the store. I'm going to drive the movie back to my home, watch the movie. Then I'm going to drive the video back and then I'm going to come home. Like that's a lot of time. Do you remember how exhausted. disappointed you'd be when the whole wall of like, you know, there'd be like a hundred covers of the movie that you went in yeah. there to go get. And then it like you peel behind each one and it's not there. It's like so disappointing. I, I, I vividly oh. remember. Oh man. And, um, <laughs> and, now, like, you know, Netflix wins. Often people are say Netflix wins because 
of the technology. Well, the technology is what allowed customers to gain back their time. Let's not, you know, I didn't excitedly run to use Netflix because I love software, right? No, <laughs> I love my time, right? So that's why they win. To your to your point um, uh, earlier, Jeff, with the DMV, <clears throat> it's like there's a lot of um, the wasted time there. And perhaps maybe the employees aren't super engaged and warm, perhaps. But I'm really interested at looking at industries that haven't evolved in a while or consumers like us are like, I do not want to go do that. Um, you know, law firms is one as well, mm-hmm. I think about. But mm-hmm. there's a few of them. So Dentistry. Uh, it, it, that dentistry. leads to... Ex- but that also ends in pain sometimes, dentistry. <laughs> yeah, or you're just too knocked out to even care. Uh, but it guess it all leads to the, the whole concept that our industries talk more about in other industries, particularly those that are succeeding, is a whole idea about experiential retail. And there was an article in a recent Washington Post talking about how the stores, there are stores that are winning at malls, and one of them that was cited was Bath and Body Works. And they mentioned that partly because you go in there, there's a smell. You can't you can't smell a candle online. There's a look. There's a limited time only offers. There's all these things that combine to that. And then the article talked about some other uh, businesses that are also succeeding because they're experiential. One of them that they mentioned was Lush, and I know that's a company that you have experience with yep. uh, as consulting with them. Uh, I've only been to Lush a couple times. It's a it's it has nothing to do with alcohol. It has to do with soap, but it's literally one of those stores where you walk in not knowing you needed thirty dollars worth of soap, and then you leave like super excited about it. Um, can you share with folks listening what what's the secret sauce with Lush and how do they get it right and what maybe they can take back from that? Yeah, I worked with Lush um, about a couple of years ago. Um, it's a combination of many things. And um, I'll share as they come to mind, uh, not in any particular order, uh, their team members. Their team members absolutely want to be there. And you can tell that they want to be there. Um, their in-store experience, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? When it comes to retail, I'm very interested in understanding how many experiences can we build to serve human senses? So what am I hearing? What am I smelling? What am I seeing? Um, I don't know if the, the touch or feel works in this uh, in this example, but uh, it has to be more than just something that's transactional. Um, retail absolutely has a place. Um, within you know our everyday purchasing behaviors, I don't want to purchase everything online, right? Um, a company the, to give you an example, uh, Warby Parker is a company that sells eyewear, and I've been studying them for a very long time. And they first started their model of buy your glasses online, and that made sense for the time, and it probably still makes sense for them as well. But one of the stores that I visit the most is their store in Toronto that they have. And they have many throughout North America, but um, I'm wearing a pair of Warby, gla- uh, Warby Parker glasses right now while I'm on this podcast. And there's times where I go to the store, even when I'm not in the market to buy glasses, I have three pairs of glasses. One will do, right? But I've gone back to buy the glasses because I want that experience again. Um, to, to your point, Carolyn, you mentioned that you kind of had a, pessimistic opinion of, of going to uh, like uh, just customer service in general, right? I think we're, we're cynical to it. Uh, but when you find a retail experience that really speaks to you, you perhaps go out of your way to buy something you're not even in the market for. And I'm a perfect example of that. But, you know, again, with Warby Parker or with Lush, it's the people, it's the, the, the design of the store, that can provide a great customer experience. And then it's also an expedited experience as well, too. For me, I don't want to be there forever, even though the store is nice and the people are friendly. I kind of want a transactional experience, whereas I don't want to be there for 30 minutes when 15 minutes will do. But uh, it really depends on how the customer values um, their success. 
Uh, my mother, for example, would, loves going to the bank and tying up the lines and talking to the <laughs> um, bank representative for 30 minutes about God knows what, <laughs> right? Um, whereas me, I was like, get me out of the bank in less than five minutes. That's my definition of success. Yeah, that's. I'm, I'm kind of probably more like your mom. My husband's always like, oh, can we go anywhere without you talking to someone? And then I come out and I'm like, well, you know what? They probably love that. That was the highlight of their whole day. And he's like, probably not. Keep moving. Let's go. <laughs> but I think you've really brought some really um, tangible takeaways here, which are that, you know, it's, it starts with hiring. It starts with listening. It starts with training and sharing. And I think those are really awesome takeaways for a retail listening, anybody who has retail outlets, or even if just someone in customer service, but I think you can take this back to office staff. It really motivates employees and makes them love coming to work almost regardless of what the industry is. So Michelle, what are some ways that um, our listeners can find you? To yes, learn more? Uh, my parents blessed and cursed me with this uh, unique name, but they blessed me because I'm easy to find. So if you just go wherever you are, whether it's YouTube or LinkedIn, whatever social network you're active on, um, you can uh, search my first and last name, and uh, I'll pop up. And from there, um, you know, if you like reading, uh, I wrote a book called The People First Culture in 2018 that's done quite well and has been received well. You can go to Amazon and type in my first and last name or People First Culture, and you can start there. And There's other ways too, but why don't we start there? And uh, you have the only website I've ever seen. I'll just spell it M I C H E L F A L C O N dot com. It's the only website ever seen that lists both university struggles and failures. So if that's not a, a tease to go check it out, failures thank can you. be your friend. It was pretty cool to read all that. And thank you for joining us today, Michelle. And thank you for listening to Convenience Matters. Convenience Matters is brought to you by Nax and produced in partnership with Human Factor. For more information, visit convenience.org.